Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see this morning, I am dressed in this nice white shirt, and I do like white shirts. The only problem with wearing something that is white is that at the end of the day, no matter how careful I have been, there are some smudges on it. Uh, maybe I'm just a little bit grotty, but uh, I think for the most of us would, uh, would agree that uh, wearing white um, opens you up to the danger that it, dirt will show up easier. And, and really, I've never actually uh, come across uh, a, a, an incident where something clean fell in the dirt and the dirt got cleaned up. It's always the other way around. It's always uh, that something that was clean, uh, that gets tainted, that gets smudged, that gets dirty. Uh, and that is true, of course, for white shirts and any clothing, really. Uh, but it is, in a like manner, true of, of us. Those who have uh, believed in Christ, those who have been cleansed, have been washed clean by the blood of Christ, who have our sins forgiven, and uh, we have been clothed with white robes of righteousness, so to speak. Uh, and yet, when we walk in this world we sometimes get tainted, get stained by the things around us, by the world, the things of the world, uh, the, the philosophies that's out there, the other beliefs that are propagated, uh, the philosophies that is there. Uh, all of them will, will, will affect us. Uh, and when it affects us enough, it starts to influence our view of God. It starts to, to dim our eyes. Uh, it starts to, to sort of distort our uh, perception of, of who God or, or discolored our, our view of him. And so it is necessary for us to regularly cleanse ourselves again with the word of God to get a proper perspective on who he is. And really that is what is true or what was true for the people of God, those who were exiled into Babylon. And the text, the text that's before us this morning is Isaiah chapter 40. And as I said last week, Isaiah is, is writing to a future generation, uh, those who were exiled in Babylon and they were living in this foreign country, this foreign culture, and all the influences that that had on them. And uh, they started to take their eyes of God. They started to be influenced by the culture of, of Babylon. Um, and it seems like they had a distorted view or a low view of God, that he became smaller in their eyes, so much so that we read in verse 27 of chapter 40, uh, actually Isaiah confronts them on this, on this attitude that they have uh, uh, through these questions. Isaiah asks them, why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, uh, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? And so they have started to question God. Their problems started to seem bigger than what it was. And that's, that's, that's always the case. When we, when we take our eyes off the Lord, our problems become so much bigger. And so when God becomes small in our view, our problems appear so much larger, so much, so much bigger. Um, and uh, here we see, we see uh, Isaiah addressing this in, in, this, in this wonderful passage. And, and because they had this, these questions about, God, why are we in this situation and, and, and what, is, what is happening? Uh, that's when the Lord, uh, through this passage, sought to comfort his people. So he, he sends his, his prophets, his priests, to comfort, comfort his people. Speak kindly to them. Tell them to, be, to get ready. Tell them to believe. Tell them to behold your God. 
look up. And so they were in need for some serious spiritual recalibration, just as perhaps maybe you need this morning to have the eyes of your faith lifted up again to behold the Lord your God. Maybe you are in need of a little bit of spiritual recalibration. Perhaps the influences of this world have, as I said, dimmed your eyes, have distorted your vision, have discolored your view of God. Uh, there's a saying that if you, if you look at, at yourself, you'll get depressed. If you look at others you'll get distressed. But if you look to the Lord, you will be most blessed. And that's what I pray the Lord would do for us this morning is to lift up our eyes again, regardless of the circumstances you may find yourself in, and just behold our God. Behold our God. Let me pray for us and then we continue. Gracious Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, that we may know you. Lord, you who are in many ways incomprehensible, your greatness surpasses our understanding and our comprehension. Lord. And yet by your grace and in your mercy, you have bow down, you have condescended to reveal yourself to us, your creatures, your people, so that we may behold our God, and that we may believe our God, and that we may trust in you. And so help us this morning, Lord, lift our eyes, I pray, that we would enlarge our vision of you, our, enlarge our understanding of you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we are in chapter 40 of Isaiah, um, in verse 12 this morning, verses 12 through to 26 we'll cover this morning. And here we see that, that Isaiah is, is, is portraying God as really the incomparable God. There is nothing that can compare to God. Uh, he's, he's incomparable in greatness. In verse 12 we read, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens of the, by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Now I love reading verses like that because it moves my mind quickly to the edge of my comprehension. Uh, I mean, how, how big is God when, when, you, when you start to read that? And, and, and it stirs me just to awesome, some wonder, to, to really to muted marvel. I'm speechless when, when I consider the greatness, the, the immensity of God. And then end up usually in, in just surrendered worship. And like the psalmist says, great is the Lord and, and greatly to be praised. He, your greatness is unsearchable. That, that's, that's all we can, can end up saying. And, and even then it's so inadequate. Uh, the word great just doesn't describe just how great, how majestic, how splendid, how glorious God is. And that's our problem. We as humans, language just cannot describe what is indescribable. And we find this throughout Scripture that, that the, the, the prophets and the apostles were trying to describe to us something that is beyond this physical and natural world. Uh, and so we use all these literary devices. We use metaphors and, and simile. Uh, now, simile is, is basically comparison. And so when you, when, you, when, you, when you read, every time you read something, he is like. That's simile. It means they are trying to describe something that they see or heard in a way using things that we know and understand to somehow explain it to us. 
And so John in Revelation is a great example of it. When he saw the exalted Christ, he said he was like a son of man. His hair was white like like snow. Out of his, his eyes were like flames of fire. It's, it's really indescribable. His voice is, is, is like many waters. It, how do you describe the indescribable? And the same with, with metaphors. We, we use things like um, God is a lion to, to, to project his, his kingly status and his power. Or, or we say that, uh, that uh, he's a good shepherd. Now, these things describe some attributes that a shepherd may have and a lion may have to explain, to give us some idea of the vastness and the greatness of God's attribute that is far beyond the actual metaphor that we, that we use. And what I love about this passage is the, is the brilliance, the genius of Isaiah in describing God. Uh, he, he was looking at God not through the lens of, of creation to describe this great and awesome God. He was actually describing God looking at creation through the eyes of God. And that's what we read. He, he, this, this vision is intensified by using this anthropomorphic lang language, which really means he ascribes human attributes to God. God does not have a hand. God is spirit. But if he did have a hand, this is the kind of hand he would have. When he scoops up water, all the waters in all the oceans and all the lakes and all the dams and all the rivers would fit in the hollow of his hand. When we scoop water, when we hardly get a mouthful, God is immense. When we measure the heavens, the universe, we use the, the largest measure, measuring unit known to man, which is the light here. The light here is the distance that speed travels at the speed of light, or that light travels at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second for a year. That's about nine and a half trillion kilometers a year. The nearest star to us is four light years away. And this, the largest of measurements that the human mind can conceive is really inadequate to measure space because it is vast. We're talking about billions of stars in just our galaxies and as we continue to discover, there are billions of galaxies. And Isaiah say, he marks it off with a span of his hand. That is the distance between his pinky or pinky and his thumb. You know, hang loose sign. <laughs> so the next time a surfer dude said to you, hang loose, brother, he said, amen, brother, God is immense, more than you may know. And so after looking upwards at the immensity of, of God, Isaiah looks downwards. He looks around. And he says that God has calculated every particle of dust, every particle of soil on the earth. Now the crust of the earth measures from between five kilometers in thickness under the ocean to about 70 kilometers. A lot of dirt times that with the surface of the earth. God has measured, he knows how many soil particles there is. And still Isaiah is not finished. He says, he weighed out the mountains. Can you imagine the size of scales that God would use to weigh out the mountains? 
to weigh out Everest, <laughs> to weigh out the Himalayans mountains, the, 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 the Andes, the Alps, the Rocky Mountains, the, the Great Eastern Divide. He says, this is how much it will weigh, and I will put it there. When we start thinking of God in these terms, it's, it quickly be, goes beyond our comprehension. It quickly leaves us astounded. The, the, the greatness, the immensity, the vastness of, of God. And all that we know in, in, in creation is really dwarfed by his greatness. And so that's why I love this, this, this different angle of trying to describe God is by looking at the universe, the created universe, through his eyes. And we see how, how great he is. And again, all that we could do is what we did this morning. How great is our God? Sing with me how great. That's, that's the only thing. It's worship. When we, when we see how incomparably great is the greatness of God. And, but Isaiah is not finished. He continues and he says, this great God is incomparable in wisdom. Verses 13 and 14. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or who as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Isaiah is really saying here in that first line, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? He's referring that, that uh, creation is measurable it's finite even though it stretches our our understanding and comprehension of the, of the size and the dimensions and and all that god has done in creating that but he's saying that god is not finite god is infinite and the, and the reason I'm saying this is the word translated there, directed, really is the word means to, to measure off or to mark off or to, or to weigh off. And so it indicates that there are, there are limits, uh, limits in, in quali quality or quantity. And so when he links this to, this to the Spirit of God, it says, who is able to measure God? Who is able to to determine how big he is. And then when he uses this in conjunction with, with wisdom, where he says, and as his counselor, who has informed him really, and whom did he have to consult? And the answer to these questions is no one. There is no one that, that can inform God of even anything because he is infinite in wisdom. He is infinite in understanding. He is infinite in every aspect of knowledge that we may have. Job says that he is perfect in knowledge. There's nothing to be added to him. And so there's no, anyone who, who, who tries to, 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 to uh, counsel God or to add something to him would, would only give back to him what he gave them. Because he is wisdom. He is the personification of wisdom and knowledge. And so he knows every specific detail of creation and every law that governs it because he created it. He knows every specific detail of each of our lives, our thoughts, our intentions, our deeds. If you mean you've, if you've heard that we tend to judge others by their deeds and ourselves by our intentions. But God, no, God knows our intentions. He knows our thoughts. He knows our deeds. Nothing is hidden from him. And not only is he all-knowing, knowing, meaning that he knows everything about everything, that he is all-wise. And, and to be all-wise is really a subset of all-knowing. 
And it, and it means that he knows how to use the facts of his infinite knowledge to best accomplish his plans and purposes in a way that glorifies him most. And so when we look at God and we see that he is infinite in knowledge, perfect in knowledge, and perfectly wise, all wise, it's a little bit absurd and even insulting when we question God about his plans and purposes. When we want to take control of our own lives because we don't like the way it's going. God has never in eternity past or eternity future had needed of anyone that he had to consult about anything. And so we need to be careful not to act as God's counselor and suggest to him that we think our way is better. Otherwise, we may find ourselves like Job did on the sharp end of his tongue when he rebuked Job for questioning him. Remember Romans 11.33 and following reads, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And Paul quoted this Isaiah 40 verse 13 uh, in regards to God's wisdom and knowledge and, 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 and justice in, in a sense that, that he will save his elect. That's the context of Romans 11, uh, well, 9 to 11, really, that there was a partial, partial hardening of the, of the nation of Israel until all the, the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. And he was patient with Israel. He is patient with Israel while at the moment they are acting as enemies to the gospel. But he's, they are beloved because of, of their forefathers, because of his promises to them. And we read then so that why? Why? Because God wants to show and wants all people to know that they have received mercy from them grace from them that that what they receive from him they do not deserve and really that is the the gospel the wisdom of god is seen in the in the gospel when we when we and sometimes we may be tempted to even consider is that is is that the best way but god in his wisdom has decreed that it is the through through the foolishness of the gospel that he would be known. First uh, Corinthians 1.18 tells us, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucify to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so God has, in his infinite wisdom, rendered the world incapable of knowing him through their wisdom. The only way that you can come to know God is through the wisdom, the foolishness of God, the foolishness of, of the gospel. 
And that message of the gospel is the power and wisdom of God. And, and this message of wisdom he has entrusted to those who have been saved through it, that we may go and preach this message so that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places, Ephesians 3 tells us. And so we, the, by the wisdom of God, he has entrusted this most precious message to us to take to the world in his wisdom. And so we have to go and preach. And furthermore, he has given us access to his infinite wisdom in how we live our lives. Proverbs 2, 6 and 7 tells us, For the Lord gives wisdom, for from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. You may remember Solomon who asked the Lord for wisdom, and God made him the wisest man who ever walked the face of the earth apart from the Lord Jesus in whom is, is hidden all the riches of the knowledge and understanding. And then he extends to us an invitation. When our lives are difficult, when trials come, when, when we are uh, con faced with, with complexities, when we are confused, when we don't see the, the answer or the future, God invites us, if we lack wisdom, ask. Ask. And the God of infinite wisdom will give to us generously and without reproach. Uh, and it will be given to us. But we must ask in Faith, not doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. And so when we come to the Lord and we, we are perplexed, we are confused, we are confronted with challenges, with trials, with tribulations, with difficulties, and we ask the Lord, Help us. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. What should we do? And the Lord give us the answer. Are you going to follow that? Or are you going to think, ah, that's, that was back for those days. That doesn't, that, that's just archaic. Well, Scripture says that the Word of God is living and active, which means it is alive, which means it is relevant. That means it is powerful to bring about what it says it can bring about. And so when we lack wisdom, let's go to the one of infinite wisdom. And that's what Isaiah was communicating to those of Judah who were exiled in Babylon and was confused and, and influenced by the things, by the society and all the, all the different views that may have, um, they have been bombarded with. He continues in verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough to uh, for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. And these couple of verses have kept me busy this week. I was trying to figure out why does he say this? Why does he bring in, why does he compare himself to the nations? Uh, and, I, and I, I think this is because of, of the people of God living in, in Babylon, in, 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 the, uh, in the city that, that was at that stage a world power. Um, 
And really, all the ancient writers praise Babylon for, for its size, for its splendor, for its, for its beauty. I mean, it was, it was a city that was dominated by this tower-like temple that they, they constructed for, the, for their god named Marduk. Uh, and it was beautified by the, by the hanging gardens of Babylon, which was one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world and, and really an engineering masterpiece for, the, for that day where you have these terraces and overhanging uh, gardens that, that I, I think, if I remember correctly, was built uh, to comfort one of the wives that was longing back to her home country. Uh, it, was, it was protected by a wall, a massive, well, actually a double wall, but the outer wall was, was so thick that two four-horse-drawn chariots could pass each other on this wall. It was a massively impressive place. It was, they were very advanced in their culture. They had advanced laws. Uh, you may remember Daniel in, in interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream uh, of the statue that he saw that the golden head, the, 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 really the epitome of, 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 of all the kingdoms were Babylon. Uh, so they were, they were a, a great nation, a powerful nation, a prosperous nation, a, a wise nation for the times. And really what, what Isaiah was saying, in comparison to God, that is nothing. It's nothing. It's insignificant. The, the nations are really insignificant when we compare it to God. We may be impressed with world powers, but in comparison to God, they are inconsequential. Nothing. It's like it's just like they, they like literally like a drop of water from a bucket. And so, if you carry a water in, and there's a, a drop falls out. <laughs> Are you going to worry about that? No, it's, it's like the, the scales. Uh, are you going to make sure there's not a particle of dust on your scale before you measure something in the marketplace? Oh, the dust is inconsequential. It's insignificant. It, it adds nothing. And so here it says that, that really, in comparison to, to the nations, God is far superior, far greater he goes about the, the, the islands. These were really the regions um, from, from, from Israel westward. They were, sometimes it was referred to the islands that were there and sometimes beyond that, all the nations beyond that. But even all of those nations is, adds nothing to God. Lebanon, which was, which was uh, known for, for, for its majestic cedar forests and, and it was teeming with wildlife, Wildlife and, and so even when, when, when all that wood, even if the whole of Lebanon was used as a offering, as, a, as, a, as an altar to offer all the animals in, in Lebanon, it would still be insufficient. It's, it's in comparison to God, that is, that is nothing. And so the nations of the world in all their splendor, in all their power and, and prosperity is, is still incomparable uh, to God. And that doesn't mean when he says that they are nothing, that they are less than nothing, and that they are meaningless, that, that he doesn't care for them. Because his common grace have allowed them to, to attain to all these achievements. And he even sends his saints to the nations to evangelize them. But it is... As, as, as the nations, as impressive as, as they are, they don't compare to God. And so having addressed the, the people's uh, really elevated view of, of the nations, of the culture, of, of their wealth, of their power, he then turns to address their, their religion as well, their, their false god, their idols. In verse 18 we read, To whom then will you liken God, and what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and the silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished of such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman. 
to prepare an idol that will not totter. Now, I would love to have seen Isaiah's face when he wrote this. I think he had a hard time not laughing. Because he's like, I mean, the, 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 the sarcasm and the irony of this is, 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 it just sort of runs through, very subtly through these, these verses. And he was saying, okay, the heavens cannot contain, there's not, it cannot, doesn't even compare to God. The, the earth, the, the mountains, they are insignificantly small. The nations, they are nothing before God. And so how, what are you going to, what are you going to make that is like him? That's going to represent him to you? And I'm sure, as I said, he's, he must be chuckling at this stage. Because it doesn't matter what you use to construct your idol. Maybe to represent even God. Remember the same thing that happened in, 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 uh, during the Exodus? That when Aaron made the golden calf, he didn't make a, a different new God for them. He made a representation of the God that, that delivered them from, from Egypt. And so they were actually transgressing the second commandment of making an image uh, or, a, 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 or an idol or any likeness that is in heaven or above or on earth or beneath uh, the waters or under the, or, uh, of the earth. And you shall not worship them and bow down to them. So that was what the commandment said. And this is what they did. They, they actually made an, an idol. And, and really what Isaiah was saying is it doesn't matter how grandiose or spectacular, how, how skilled the craftsman is in making the idol, how much ornamentation you you. you lavished on this idol, how stable you make it and how durable the material is you use, it will always ever be a work of man. And it will need the help of man to move and not to totter, not to, not to wobble. As I said, I mean, Isaiah was just showing in a very clever, subtle way, this futility and the stupidity of idolatry in, this, in, this, uh, in these verses. And he says, no, don't, don't worship an idol a who tries to represent even God. We, we, we worship the incomparable God. There is no one like him. And that is repeated throughout scriptures. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Deuteronomy 3, 24. O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works, mighty acts as yours? Psalm 71, verse 19. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things, O God. Who is like you? Psalm 86, verse 8. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Psalm 89, verse 8. O Lord, of, uh, uh, o Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty God? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. There is no one like our God. We, it's futile to turn to idols, to make idols. And yet, 
We do. We may be more sophisticated. We don't make an idol anymore. But idolatry is as rife today as it was back in the day of Israel and, and any time in history. And, and the reason for that is always the same. Our desires, what we want. So if I want security and protection, I would worship what I think would give it to me. Money, perhaps. If I want to be uh, desired, uh, have sex appeal, or even a long life, then I'm going to worship what will give it to me. I may worship diet or exercise because that is, that I will bow down, I will, I will serve it, I will follow it, I will, I will sacrifice to get that. Why? Because it gives me what I desire. If you desire respect or recognition, then you will worship those who you think will grant you the recognition and the respect that you desire. And again, it is, it is shameful. It is laughable when, when the God of incomparable greatness have said, I will take care of you. I will provide you. I will lead you. I will grant you life in abundance that we would turn because of the influences of the world and take our eyes off God and f focus it on an idol. Isaiah continue, he says that God is incomparable in sovereignty. Verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have they, their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. And Isaiah asks these four rhetorical questions to all four. The answer is yes, we have heard, we, we do know um, because they have heard from the beginning. God has revealed it to them through his word and through his deeds that he is absolutely sovereign. He, does, uh, he will fulfill his plans and his purposes according to his own good pleasure. And there is no one and nothing that can thwart that. He is the ultimate, final, and complete authority over everything and anyone, and everyone rather. And it may be that Judah have started to doubt this, being exiled in Babylon and being influenced by that society. And maybe they could not understand God's plans and purposes. Maybe they think that Babylon and their gods were stronger than, than the God of Israel. And really, it doesn't matter when... When we, when we find ourselves in, in circumstances where we don't understand, is God really in control? Look, look what's going on. The answer that God gives us is always, trust me. I am in control. What is happening is how, is how I choose to bring about my perfect plan, conceived in perfect wisdom, to bring to perfect fruition. Trust me. And there is not a God or a deity, a king or a ruler that can compare to him in his sovereign power. And so Isaiah was was drawing attention or, or, or rather lifting up the eyes of these doubting exiles to the lofty grandeur of God's greatness. He says, remember, he is high and exalted. He, he sits above the circle of the earth. 
referring to this to the sphere like shape of, of, of the earth. And the people are are like grasshoppers to him. He's the one who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and, and, and allow men to dwell under it like, like, like if they dwell in a tent. He determines who rules when and where and for how long. And as the psalmist says that it is not from the east nor from the west nor from the desert come exaltation, but God is the judge who puts down one and exalts the other. And so the kings, the rulers, the judges of the world, he's the one who raised them up and he's the one who takes them down as he pleases, when he pleases, when they have completed his task. And so we've seen already the Assyrians were, were the rod of God's anger, the, the staff of his indignation when, when they came against Judah in Isaiah 10. And, and Babylon is... is uh, it was, was really consecrated uh, to execute his anger, we read in Isaiah 13. And later on we read that King Cyrus, the Mede, he will act as God's shepherd, the shepherd of his choosing to do his bidding. These are pagan nations, pagan kings. And really all governments everywhere throughout history, past and, and, and present and future, really serves the plan and purposes of God. I know that stretches our faith <laughs> when we look at what's going on. But really, that's what Scripture says, that there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And God said, these governments, they are my servants, they are my deacons, my ministering agents to bring about my plans and my purposes. And so he decides... And they are all very transitory and, and, and it's very, very short-lived really because scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have they shoot down roots and he blows on them and they're gone. And if you look at world history, you'll see all the, the great empires. You can't even remember most of them. It's like blown away. And he ends up, in verse 25, to whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. And we know that scripture teaches that God created the heavens and he created them for his glory. He created them ex nihilo, which means he spoke them into existence. And the, the audience of Isaiah, they lived in Babylon and was influenced by their views, their gods, their religion, who saw the stars as gods. And there they had a explanation for the origin of the universe. They, they believed that, they, that their gods uh, had to bring order to the cosmos. And of course, they had many gods, and, and these gods, their decisions were made in, in a divine sort of council. And at one, at one of these councils, they've decided to make Murdoch uh, their chief god. And he had to bring order to the cosmos. And, and so before he could do that, he first had to overcome the opposition of a goddess called Tiamat. And so after he defeated her, he could then only start at beginning to think about bringing order to the, to the, to the cosmos because he first had to consult another goddess uh, named Ea, the god uh, of, of wisdom. The god of the Bible, don't, there is no opposition to him. There is no need for, for him to take counsel from anyone. And so <laughs> I mean, we, we, we smile at, up at the absurdity of these primitive beliefs. But to be honest, their version is much more plausible than what many believe today, which is it happened by itself from nothing. 
You need a lot more faith to believe that. <laughs> and so the Babylonians would look at the stars and the constellations, constellations and, and they, would, they would glean direction for their, for, for, for their lives. And so really they would practice astrology. And Israel had a history of looking to the stars. We, you remember Stephen when he, just before he was martyred, actually mentioned the star Romfa, which uh, Israel looked to, and Moloch, who, who, they, who they worship in the desert. And so they were susceptible to these kinds of things. But Isaiah was saying, no, the God of incomparable greatness, he made these stars. <laughs> These billions of billions of stars. He named them. Each one has their own name. He determined their position. He determined the constellations. I mean, that's Job, which is considered probably the oldest book in the, in the Bible, writes of these things. He said in Job 38, Can you bind the chains of Pleiades? or lose the core of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with its satellites? And for those of you who like astronomy would recognize these as star constellations. God put them there. He made them. And he sustains them by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. The potency of his power, his ability to do that. And it's almost like he acts as a shepherd to them. That not one of them is missing. The great shepherd that shepherds our souls, shepherds the stars. And so for us this morning, I pray that these few verses have lifted up your eyes again to behold God, the greatness of him. That is, he is truly incomparable. Incomparable in greatness, in wisdom, to the nations, to, to idols, to, to, in, in sovereignty and in power. We serve and worship a great God. And if you ever get the chance... Take your Bible, take a telescope and drive out into the outback on a clear night and look up and have a private worship service. Behold our God. But even more so, the Lord God revealed himself, his greatness, as I said, in the gospel in salvation. He is incomparable in his love, in his grace, and in his mercy. And he manifested that by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. It has to be a propitiation for our sins. And he demonstrated, if you still doubt the love of God, well, he demonstrated it that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. And he commanded us that we should remember that. We should remember that regularly by coming to the, to the Lord's table by coming to remember what he has done and celebrate what we have because of what he has done. And, and that's what we're going to do now is, is just transition into remembering our great God who is, has bowed down and condescended to save sinners like, like you and me.